From the 1750s to the 1860s, thousands of Scots were forced to leave the lands their families had lived on for centuries to make room for sheep, whom their landlords deemed were more valuable than the families tending cattle and farming the land. This period was known as the Clarences. These Scots who left for the New World or some larger cities within the British Isles were what we would call today refugees. After being forced to turn their back on their cultural traditions and their own history after the failed Jacobite rebellions, they were now less than half a dozen years later were forced to flee under threat as their homes were sometimes burned with family members who refused to leave still inside. Sometimes coerced through vague promises of a better life or land elsewhere, but for the most part, it was not of their own free will. Whether these refugees were part of an attempt of cultural genocide is questioned up for debate and one I will be examining here and on my new channel, How We Got Here History. One of the first significant groups of Scottish refugees to come to the New World arrived in Pictou, Nova Scotia in 1773, aboard the Hector. The town and county of Pictou, to this day, almost 250 years later, still celebrate the Hector and the spirit of survival these refugees brought to the area as they sought to rebuild their lives. If you have family who wound up in Canada at some point because of the clearances, there is a good chance that they or one of their kinsmen made their way through Pictou at some point. And today, the town of Pictou is home to McCull House, a great resource for those seeking information about their own families or just wanting to learn more about the Scots who came. And in this video, I will be interviewing a researcher from there as she joins me to talk about what they have to offer and how they can help you in uncovering your own family story. But before I begin, if this is the type of content that flips your kill, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment about your own Scottish ancestors. Hi, I'm Brian Nash from How We Got Here Genealogy, and, and I would like to introduce my guest for today, Susan Parker. Today we're going to be talking about um, Nova Scotian immigrants, uh, specifically to, through Picto. Um, Susan works at the um, McCullough House and Museum in Picto, Nova Scotia. Um, hi, Susan. Welcome to... Uh, my channel and uh, I like to usually start off my when I'm talking to guests just to ask them a little bit about themselves to get the audience to get to know them so um, Susan um, do you have a did you have an interest in genealogy before um, you started working at the McCullough house yeah um, my mom's family in particular has quite a bit of genealogy done and they link back to the ship Hector, actually. So it's always been an interest in the family to trace all the roots back to Scotland and figure out exactly what villages that our ancestors came from. And when you, um, when you you've done that as a family, what what areas of Scotland are you from? Um, primarily around the Lockbroom area on the west coast and then we have quite a few connections in the inverness area on the east coast as well many of us celtic canadians as i like to call us um they're you know it's kind of diverse but they all sort of did they all sort of uh meld once they got to canada or what would be canada yeah <laughs> yeah it's interesting they uh a lot of the ones from the western side of Scotland end up in the western side of our county. And then uh, a lot of the ones from the eastern side end up in the eastern side of the county. But they met somehow. Okay. And, and you're from Pictou yourself, or Pictou County? Yeah, Pictou, yeah. Okay. So it sounds like you have deep roots there. Yeah, yeah, it was 250 years. 250? With the Hector that's coming up, that's right. I've been here seven years as a summer student, okay. as I went through... <laughs> I'm on my third degree now for history at okay. the University of New Brunswick. Okay, awesome. Um, so you'd be working on a PhD and that's in Atlantic Canadian history, is it? Yeah. Tell us, let's, let's start with uh, Thomas McCullough. Who, who was Thomas McCullough and why is there a museum named after him? So Thomas McCullough was a minister that came over from Scotland. He was originally going to PEI, but then when the locals in Picto realized he's quite intelligent and educated. They wanted to keep him, so they convinced him to stay here in Picto. And this is about 1803. And he ended up, instead of going to PEI where he was supposed to be a minister, 
ended up staying here and he acted as a minister at the local Presbyterian church. And he also worked towards creating a college in Picto, which eventually became Picto Academy. And a lot of his early ideas actually led to responsible government in Nova Scotia. And that, that's actually what a responsible government in a lot of places had come from Presbyterians just because that's kind of the model of their church government, which they just brought over into secular society. Thomas was a, a, a Presbyterian minister who basically um, settled there. Would he still have descendants in the Picto area today? Uh, I don't think we've found many within Picto. Uh, but there have been descendants that come back every summer here and there that um, are connected somehow to his children. Let's just talk a little bit about the, the center then. We're open year round at the center for research and genealogy. Um, if you come in the fall, in the winter, it's normally quite quieter. In the summertime, we do have more summer students around. So we can handle more projects, but it will be a lot busier. What would I expect to find if I, I went there? We have quite a few resources about local Scottish families and settlers to the area. Um, we normally get quite a few people who have Scottish roots come in to figure out where my ancestors lived, where they might have settled, uh, some of the occupations. Like we have a lot of um, atlases and house records to figure out exactly where people ended up especially in the 19th century that's one of the most popular ones is trying to figure out where people ended up living it, it, it's centered around the, the hector's arrival but it, as i understand it actually contains much more and it's not just um people scottish origin and necessarily that you guys have uh, all the records for it's pictonians and um, people arrive through Picto no matter where they came from. One of the the things that I've just recently discovered is your Haggis software. Uh, so what does Haggis stand for? It's an acronym that represents this uh, connection back to the Hector with H standing for Hector. And it goes into this um, archival genealogy tool. And we basically thought it was a really funny way to embrace this Scottish identity into an digital archive. What would I be able to access that possibly I might not be able to access anywhere else? We have a lot of our photographs in particular, but a lot of original material that is up there. So deeds, wills, personal letters. Um, in particular, one of my favorite collections we have is the Don McIsaac collection. And it's roughly probably about 10,000 photos. Like it's a huge collection. Um, and he has some photos that people have never seen before of Picto and its history. And he's collected photos from before his time as well. And we have quite a few of them online. Um, so there'd be a difference, obviously, of what I can get online or I could get at the, the center. What, through the online, you know, what, would I be able to find some of these records? Maybe not view them, but at least know they're there. So I'd be able to search for them if I was looking for a specific ancestor? Or... Yeah, there's quite a few, I think we have over 6,000 uh, documents on the Haggis system right now. And there's quite a few where um, there are either indexes or finding aids to other files we have uh, physical copies of. And a lot of those times you can search a name and it'll pop up in those indexes and then you'll know right away which collection your ancestor might be in. Um, and would that be indexed so that identify the same ancestor or would it just be, for instance, I have an ancestor, Andrew Anderson, and I, I've looked through several generations of my family. That was a very common name and it's a, a very common name would have been in, in Scotland. So. I would assume I'd probably find more than one possibly there or a Donald McDonald uh, type name, you know, what just very common ones. Does your index have a, a method of connecting the same Donald McDonald's or would just give me a list of every of all the records you have that might contain a Donald McDonald? It'd give you all the records, but what we've tried to do is include um, dates with names as well as community locations to help narrow that down. Do your records extend past Picto County or is it just pretty much um, strictly Picto County that you... The majority is Picto County centric, but we do have quite a few that are Anakinish and Colchester, so our bordering counties. And we do have resources that um, connect largely to Nova Scotia and the Maritimes and Canada as well. If I was a person and I knew very little about my own family history, 
but I'm I'm wanting to start. I knew that. Well, my 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 grandmother said her grandfather was from New Glasgow, but that's and he came from Scotland at some point, or you know, his family did. Um, how much information would I need to have that for you to be able to help me get started? You know, so I could find maybe who this person is, like what and what would I need to to bring to the table other than a name? Yeah. Um... Normally, if it's a more unique name, if we had the husband and wife's name or something like that, or the name of a child, uh, also like dates and community are really good as well. Especially when you start getting really common names like an Alexander Fraser and stuff like that. We can normally narrow it down once we know maybe a couple other family names or dates and community, occupation, stuff like that. Okay. And now do you, also work if somebody was doing that how how deep do you get into assisting somebody or we offer three different levels so we have unassisted where basically we let you go through um, our catalogs and you can tell us what files you want to look at and we'll pull them for you and basically it's up to you to decide what's relevant um then we have a next level of service where we assist you and we help you and we pull out things we pull out things that are somewhat relevant or we think would match and help guide you towards those. And then we also have a whole service where you basically send us what you want to be researched. We'll do all the research for you and then send a nice little uh, file to you when it's done. So I, I can come from being a, a uh, somebody who knows, like I said, absolutely nothing, but, you know, be able to get you guys to really guide me and get me started that I can hopefully trace trace my route. When you do that, do you go past, again, like I said, if I was a person from away and I, I sort of knew the basis of when my family was there in Pictou and, and maybe you figured out when they arrived, do you, do you fill in the gaps between, help fill in the gaps between when they left um, Pictou, Nova Scotia and afterwards, or you just, that's sort of the, the limit? We try to go as far as we can. Um, if we can figure out if maybe they lived in Picto for uh, one or two generations and then moved to the States, we know we try to figure out if we can find exactly when they left, when they start disappearing off census records. Um, sometimes there's arrival lists for the States that we can look at too, to kind of narrow that down. Okay, great. And how far back the other way? Um, I've traced my ancestor to the, the coming in through Picto. Um, but I don't really know much about their history before they were. Maybe I like I have it all down to when they arrived in Canada and Nova Scotia, but I know nothing before. What what resources or help would you be to somebody looking for that? Yeah, it's normally when we would start consulting uh, both books and primary sources we have, as well as we have a large collection of genealogies that are already done, where people have actually gone to Scotland and figured out where their ancestors came from. And some of them even have uh, pictures of the churches and the gravestones that their ancestors were in. So that way we can actually connect them back to that Scottish connection. And likewise, if I'm a person and I have that, I have those records, um, is there a way for me to share them with the house so they can use them for other people or in the, the research? Is that something that happens frequently? Yeah, we love taking donations of research like that. And we actually have quite a few in the last few years of people who did up genealogy books, even just for their own family who came back to donate a copy for us so we can use it for other researchers. What's, what's the farthest away, I guess, that a person has come to, to seek um, information? Yeah, we, well, this year in particular, there's been a lot of Americans now that the border's back open. And I think the farthest away we've had is Australia and New Zealand. That would be very common, I, you know, for, Maybe one brother will have to wound up in Australia and New Zealand and one, you know, sister or brother or an uncle have been in Nova Scotia at some point. And then, and then there would be a group of people that actually move from Nova Scotia to Australia and New Zealand afterwards as well. Um, thinking of specifically um, Norm McDon Reverend Norm MacDonald, I think, that all left and basically founded it. Once they tried to get, like, incorporate Nova Scotia, they decided to go to Australia. But is it the people there that are just looking for yeah, more 
more information? Do you find that or do you find it's more, you know, serious genealogists that are just not so much out of curiosity? Oh, I just want to know a little bit about my relatives that landed in Nova Scotia or, or that are looking for that deeper information. It's a mix of both, but a lot of people, um, especially when their ancestors moved to a different country, they'll have all those resources from after they moved, but it's that connection back to Canada that they've lost. And that's normally where they contact us to try to figure out how did they end up in this place. What's kind of the, the most interesting story you can think to tell? Um, you know, it's embarrassing, don't, you don't have to say names, but you know, just something that, you know, interesting in just in, in the, the story, but you know, as a, a genealogist and researcher that you, you found, you know, this was just really, really exciting. I got to find out and use maybe new resources that I never would have come across otherwise. Yeah, I've been actually, this summer, we've had quite a few people um, who had the same ancestor name, but they're all different uh, Frasers. But it's all this, all, everyone in the family has the same first name. So it's a, it's one of those like really interesting puzzles where you're trying to decipher who's the right Fraser from the right town. And I've really had to dig into as many old maps to figure out the old street names that have since changed, looking through deeds and properties and trying to figure out exactly where their houses were and um, reading about these older Picto families that we don't often get to look into. So you, you mentioned old street maps and stuff. Uh, so do you actually have a good resource that street names I know have changed numbers and stuff in places and that's often one of the the difficulties for people, for instance, my, my grandparents, my, my grandmother married my grandfather the day he shipped overseas and it was on Vernon street in um, Halifax. The number it, that it gave is where they got married. doesn't exist anymore, but because they renumbered the streets, I was very interested in seeing, just seeing the, uh, the house. Cause I knew from stories, they got married at a little B and B like a B and B type place. And I was just really curious to see it. Um, so yeah, I had to, search through things and find where that house actually was. So do you guys, do you have that? Do you have a lot of people, you know, that are from away just like, do you know this place? Can you show me where it is? Or do you have a... Yeah, we have, um, we have these house inventory sheets that have the old number and system still on them. And we've, we're actually in the process of updating them so that we have both the old and the new numbers. Okay. And we also have, one of my favorite resources is the Pictou County Atlas, which I think Pictou County, PEI, and a few places in Ontario are the only places that have these atlases. And it has every single community in the, and the towns in Pictou County with labels of houses and property lines and how many acres were in each property. So it's one of the best resources to go back and find people. And it's from 1879. So as long as we can figure out who was living there in 1879, we can normally trace that. For, from a personal perspective, have you you come across any unknown relatives that you just uh, you know you're you're looking and you you figure out that they have oh we have the same third great grandmother or um, you know and maybe that's actually helped you in your own personal research because maybe they have information uh, about people that you haven't for instance you know, they've gone back to Scotland and they found their, um, their home place, uh, their original house or whatever. Um, do you have any of those type of experiences yourself where it's like, because you're working there, you, if you hadn't been, you might not have never known. Yeah. It's gone both ways. I've found quite a few genealogies of some of my mom's ancestors and figured out where they came from Scotland because I was working here. And I've also met people who are connected to my mom's side as well, who hadn't had any idea how their connection worked down. And then I'm like, I have a genealogy. <laughs> and there's all the information you need. Oh, that's great. Um, now, we talked a lot about this, the Scottish and uh, immigration, because that was a big part of the, the Pictou County. And like I mentioned before, and we talked about, you have records basically of Pictou County. Um, sort of what, what time frames would you sort of cover um, that might have the unique records? And is there any special collections? Like, do you have collections that would help if, um, you know, looking up different you know, veterans records that maybe 
um, soldiers who were in the First or Second World War, would you have good records, like from the county's perspective, of where they have of them? Um, I know often communities will have memorials to uh, the people that have gone, that went over to the war and then maybe had died. Um, they might have sp specific monuments besides just if the person was brought back or, but would you, which in most cases they weren't, but would you have records of those type of things? Um, and if so, how kind of deep and I, I want to say more, more, more modern records do you, do you delve into? Yeah, we have quite a bit of 19th century and early Picto, which I think is interesting. And in modern terms, we actually do have quite a few uh, soldiers records, especially if it was in the newspaper and they wrote letters home. Yeah. And Picto Academy also had quite a few uh, dedications to its former students who ended up in the military, uh, which is a great resource for anyone who lived in Picto or around the area. Uh, we keep pretty much a lot of Anything that was in the advocate, the Picto advocate, the local newspaper, we have quite a few Picto Academy things that are modern that we can refer back to and we keep up with a lot of the local literature um, up into uh, 1990s and 2000s so that we can keep those more 20th century connections. And you mentioned the Picto advocate, so would you have, you guys have full copies of uh, them going back to a certain date or? there be, or, and other newspapers that Picto might have had as well. Yeah, we have uh, the Eastern Chronicle and Picto Advocate, two local papers, and we have, those are both on microfilm, and Picto Advocate from, I think, 1895 to 1982 we have, and then we have physical copies of it from about 2008 to present day. And would that be indexed or would I just, if I was looking for something, would I have to go through the, the microfilm and look at, hopefully have an idea of the range that I'm looking for? Yeah, actually all these um, uh, card catalogs behind me are the microfilm index. Okay. And we have it really well indexed, not just vital stats like birth, marriage, death, but we also have business directories, shipping news, um, anything about hospitals, mining, stuff like that is all divided into subject categories as well to make it easier to find them. So if a person knew, like for instance, their grandfather had played on a hockey team in Picto, the, um, you know, they might be able to, and they knew their age, so they would have been whatever range they could go back and maybe search, um, search there, or would they be able to actually search by the name? Is it indexed that well or just more by subject? Um, dependent if they had an article about their grandfather, for instance, uh, it could be in biography, but we also have sections for sports, for instance, that would just have news about sports teams and stuff. So it wouldn't necessarily be by name, but it would be sorted by date for the subject. In the, the early history of Pictou County, is there any names that you've come across that are just surprising? Like, or that's not a Scottish, that's not a British, that's not an Irish name. That's like, where, how did they come over? Like, you know, maybe through Scotland, but you know, just like, there's a story here, how they got to Scotland, let alone how they came to Pictou County. Yeah, we have a few families where um, they're not Scottish, but then changed their name to be Scottish. So it's a made up Scottish surname. And then uh, we have quite a few, um, foreign Protestant families that came up through South Shore that ended up here. And then they're so common now, you just assume they're Scottish, but then it turns out they're actually um, French, Swiss, German kind of influence. Uh, so that, so did they just settle in or had they gone back somewhere and then come back to through Picto or? Uh, for the foreign Protestants, they basically left the South Shore, settled in Picto, and now they're one of the main families you'll find, um, in particular, it's the Langell family. So in River John, anyone from that area, you're definitely related to a Langell. So they'd be the, the French, Swiss, uh, and Germanic thing. Nobody took took on a, a Scottish name like Mick Schmidt or, uh, you know, you don't have anybody like that or. No, we uh, have, I think the, the one that's 
you see a lot around here that was the made up Scottish name was McKeel. Yeah. Which and is it's totally a made up Scottish next and fit in. And was there a, an actual origin to that name be before McKeel or is it, is it a common origin or is it just? Um, I don't know where they, the original surname was, but I'm pretty sure they were uh, more inland Europe than they were anything connected to the UK. So before we, so is there anything that you'd like to, to let people know, like if they're coming to Picto and they're coming to the McCollum Museum, what, what, uh, you know, no matter who their ancestors might be, or even if they have ancestors, what's, you know, kind of a, a prize in your collection? I think one of our biggest conversation starters right now is we have the window from the old post office which doesn't sound spectacular at first, but then you find out it was actually in the chimney of the building. Uh, it was designed to go in their chimney, which it will never be used as a natural window, but somehow they decided that was a great design, but they have uh, since replaced the window. We ended up with the original one and we have it on display in our center. Okay, so that's just a quirky little thing. Um, yeah. Now, what other things in Picto County but I go to the McCall Center, I'm finding out with my ancestors. Um, you know, what other what other places would you steer people that are interested in finding out or just exploring that Picto County aspect of their ancestry that you know they did they need to see? Yeah, um, depending on how they what connection they found, I really recommend you going to visit the community their ancestor lived in or going to visit some of the other amazing um, archives and museums around here, like in Tatamagush and Anakinish as well. They have great resources there. Uh, we also recommend if they have connections to the Hector, to go check out the Hector Key. And even at our site, we have escape rooms and outdoor adventure games that are historically based. So depending on how much they like the history, we have these great things for them to keep their time occupied. A historical genealogical escape room? Yeah. Wow. That sounds like I, I need to head that back to world. <laughs> yeah. um, hear the story of a family who left Scotland because of the clearances to make a new life in Canada. Click here. And thanks for watching, and keep searching for your own ancestors.